Hey everybody, this is Victor here from Cyborg for Life. Today I have a very special interview for you. He's the founder and director of the Paley Orthopedic and Spine Institute in West Palm Beach, Florida. Please enjoy the interview with Dr. Dror Paley. All right, everyone, today we have a very special guest joining us. He is the founder and director of the Paley Orthopedic and Spine Institute in West Palm Beach, Florida. He has single-handedly revolutionized the field of modern-day limb lengthening and deformity reconstruction. Having performed well over 20,000 procedures, he's developed innovative surgical methods and devices such as the Precise 2 and Stride Internal Nails, which serve as the gold standard other surgeons in the field use. Patients seeking the best care from all over the world come to him for his 30 plus years of experience and are reassured by his motto, you deserve the best. Please join me in welcoming world renowned orthopedic surgeon and king of limb lengthening himself, Dr. Dror Paley. Hey, Dr. Paley, how are you doing today? Good, Victor. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Paley, your accomplishments, qualifications, contributions to orthopedics are second to none. Uh, you earned your medical degree from the University of Toronto. You did your internship at Johns Hopkins, residency at University of Toronto Hospital, and you were also a professor of orthopedics at University of Maryland, Toronto, and Vermont. Not only have you taught other orthopedic surgeons, but you also founded facilities where they now work, including the International Center of Limb Lengthening at the Rubin Institute for Advanced Orthopedics in Baltimore, Maryland, my hometown. Uh, also, you've earned several awards and published hundreds of peer-reviewed and doctor-reviewed articles, books, journals, and just about any other form of literature one could think of. You really have pioneered the industry and pushed it to a whole other level. So doing so much for the field of orthopedics, I'd like to jump into everything, but obviously today our focus is on limb lengthening, one of the many aspects you deal with in your practice. So to start us off, can you tell us briefly how you got your start and became interested in limb lengthening? Sure. I, uh, <clears throat> I started uh, in the mid 80s and uh, um, I, I heard about this and then went over to Europe to, uh, when I finished my residency, went over there to uh, uh, spend some time with the Italians who were the first group doing it in Western Europe. And then um, with their help, I got to Ilizarov, who was in the Soviet Union and he was kind of the father of limb lengthening and uh, trained with him. So I spent about seven months over in Europe and uh, in Russia, uh, training there, learned Italian, learned Russian, um, and, uh, and learned how to lengthen limbs and correct deformities and all the other things you do with these techniques. And brought them over to, uh, actually at the time I was in Canada, so that's why all of this actually started in Canada before the US, hmm. and then in, um, 1980, so that was in 86, and in 87, I moved to the U.S. and uh, to Baltimore, your town. Uh, I was there for 22 years, and we started uh, started at the University of Maryland, um, and uh, we set up the uh, International Center for Limb Lengthening. Um, it, uh, it moved from the University of Maryland to Sinai Hospital, and uh, I was there as the director of that institute for eight years. Uh, in fact, everyone who's there, I hired them pretty much, uh, except some of the newer ones. Um, and then <clears throat> I uh, left uh, uh, to come to sunny Florida uh, and start a private institute here um, uh, called Paley Orthopedic and Spine Institute. Uh, it's that on campus of St. Mary's Medical Center. Uh, we have actually 14 surgeons, um, and uh, we have more limb lengthening surgeons here than any other place, I think, anywhere else in the world. Um, and uh, we do a huge number of limb lengthening surgeries on a daily and weekly and monthly basis here. Wow. So it's been uh, a, a really uh, great 30 something years now. <laughs> Crazy. So you learned from the originator himself, Dr. Lizaroff. you transcended his techniques and you even further evolved the field. I mean, that's, that's really amazing. How many uh, limb lengthening uh, procedures would you say that you do per month at your facility? I mean, so I myself do between 20 to 30 cases a, a week. <laughs> and, um, you know, so I'm probably, operate about 40 weeks a year, so you can do the math. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and then I have uh, several partners, all of whom uh, do limb lengthening uh, 
not as large a volume as I do, but they're all pretty busy. Um, and then some of them we do, we work together, like Dr. Robbins and I work closely together on all the stature patients. We run the stature service together uh, because I really feel it's important uh, to have more than one doctor there. Uh, you know, if I'm out of town, mm -hmm. He's there. If he's out of town, I'm there. So there's never a time where, um, you know, one of the two of us are not there for our patients. So patients are very well covered. We both do, we're both involved in every single surgery. Okay. Wow. That's really amazing. Okay. So you have a team of experts among the best in the world. So, um, so I want to dive a little deeper to some, you know, questions that people always ask about limb lengthening. Um, as the procedure becomes more popular and, you know, people are looking to increase their height uh, and get taller, it's sometimes said that too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. And so what are your thoughts on like the safe limits that, a, you know, a potential patient could lengthen their legs uh, and what would be some of the drawbacks that you see, um, you know, from other uh, patient uh, centers? Sure. Well, so, um, you know, limb lengthening, I, I often joke around as a dangerous sport. And it's, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of risks and a huge number of potential complications from lengthening. Mm. Um, it, it's an unusual surgery in that it's what I call four-dimensional surgery. Mm -hmm. because as the element of time, you know, so three dimensional, all surgery is anatomic. You're altering anatomy. That's three dimensional, mm -hmm. but we alter anatomy over time, over days, weeks, months. Yeah. And so it, it's a very different thing. You know, if you go in and do a hip replacement, mm -hmm. you alter the anatomy, right? Right. And, but it's done in a two hour surgery, you're done yeah. and you know, patient rehabilitates and that's it. Yeah. In this thing, we go in, you have your surgery, we put, well, we used to, in the old days, we'd put an external fixator on, mm -hmm. you know, modern days, we use these implantable nails. Now the latest and greatest, the stride nail, and we break the bone. Mm -hmm. the patient leaves the operating room with uh, nothing to show. For, they're not any taller <laughs> and, you know, they haven't achieved any goal yet. Right. Then, using a machine to lengthen the, the femur mm -hmm. or the tibia, they gain a millimeter a day, let's say, um, each day. At the end of, let's say, 80 days, they've got 80 millimeters, which is just over three inches. Mm -hmm. So the anatomic change of growing in height, operation really doesn't end until the last millimeter of lengthening. Wow, yeah. So the hip replacement took two hours. Mm -hmm. For me to make someone three inches taller, okay, it took three months. Three months you know? yeah. And so that's what you have to think about. This is four-dimensional surgery. Mm -hmm. Now, you're not just lengthening the bone. And you know the, the whole science of limb lengthening and the whole revolution of limb lengthening was, is based on the fact that bones and soft tissues mm -hmm. will regenerate right. if you slowly pull on on them so bone you know when you break a bone bone right away wants to make new bone to glue the ends together mm -hmm. to heal itself right um and the we fool the bone by pulling it apart a tiny amount mm -hmm. and the amount that we pull it apart is based on how much the bone can actually grow make new bone tissue every day mm -hmm. turns out that limit is around three quarters to one millimeter a day. Okay. Millimeter is a 25th of an inch. Mm -hmm. So it's not a very large amount. And so you can't just lengthen an inch all at once. It's not a matter of just stretching. If you do that, you'll end up with an empty gap. Instead, we pull very, very gradually. Mm -hmm. And so the bone can keep up and the gap between the bones fills in with new bone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the, the secret of lengthening. So, so the question you might ask is, so what's the limitation of doing that? How far can you lengthen and it'll still make new bone? Right. So it's interesting. You can lengthen as long as the person's making good bone, you could lengthen probably even up to 15 centimeters. Wow. It takes a long time. Think of that. That would be 150 days. <laughs> okay. That'd be six inches in one bone. 
Right. Um, but the bone's not the problem. Mm -hmm. It's not the limiting factor. Right. The limiting factor is everything else. Mm -hmm. It's the soft tissues. Okay. So you got the bone and the soft tissues. What are the soft tissues? Yeah. Muscle is the biggest one. Mm -hmm. You got nerves, you got blood vessels, you got skin, right? Mm -hmm. All of those are the soft tissues. And they make up a much bigger bulk of tissue. Mm -hmm. So if you think of a cross section of your thigh or your lower leg, mm -hmm. the bulk of that is not bone. Okay. Um, the bulk of that is the soft tissues. It's the muscles. Mm -hmm. And the muscles are the, the, the muscles and to a lesser extent, the nerves and blood vessels are the main limiting factors to lengthen. Okay. Wow. So, um, as you lengthen, the muscle has to grow, it has to lengthen. Mm -hmm. And how does it do that? So it'll stretch a little bit. Right. But beyond that, it actually has to make more muscle. Yeah. Now, when we lengthen, we're anchored to the bone, mm -hmm. but we're not anchored to the soft tissues. Right, right. So how do the soft tissues even lengthen? Mm -hmm. They lengthen because they get dragged along by the bone. Uh -huh. So as the bone stretches the muscle, the muscle hopefully will grow new muscle. Mm -hmm. But it's not like the bone. We don't go in, cut the muscle, and then pull the muscle apart to grow new muscle, right? right. You don't go in and cut a nerve and then pull the nerve <laughs> apart to grow new nerve. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, but in the bone, we do. We cut the bone, we pull it apart, and it makes new bone in the gap. Mm -hmm. the soft tissues, they grow because they're stimulated by tension. Mm. So the tension of the lengthening, we call distraction, uh -huh. that distraction stimulates the cells in the muscle, mm -hmm. in the nerve, in the blood vessels, in the skin, mm -hmm. to make new cells, okay, and grow. Now what happens when that, those cells can't keep up? Mm -hmm. Then you get scar tissue. I'll give you the best example, the most visible example of that. Yeah. Any limb lengthening patient has seen that they get some stretch marks on their skin. That's skin, scar tissue. What do you think? That's scar tissue. It's not skin. Scar tissue. Wow. That's cool. So it is a failure of the ability of the soft tissue to keep up. Oh, I see. So bone's the only tissue that doesn't heal with scar tissue. It heals with bone. Wow. All the other tissues heal with scar tissue. Mm -hmm. So when you lengthen a muscle too fast, get scar tissue and get stiff doesn't move that well right when you lengthen a nerves and blood vessels too fast you get scar tissue and the nerves start work stop working wow so so you got to be careful because those tissues can only handle so much okay and so they become the limiting factor now of all of those the biggest amount of tissue is the muscles right and they're the biggest bulk and the muscles have one particular feature that makes them a problem for limb lengthening. Mm -hmm. So a muscle has fibers like this. And as you move your muscle, fibers come apart and come together. That's what a muscle contraction is. It's a group of fibers that attract and repel each other. Right. Okay. That's actually microscopically what's happening in a muscle. So a muscle has a certain excursion. Mm -hmm. When you, you know, when I stretch like this, my biceps muscle is getting longer. Mm -hmm. When I bend it, Fibers come together and the fibers get shorter. Right. So the actual muscle fibers mm -hmm. can increase in length. Mm -hmm. No other tissue can do that. That's so cool. A nerve can't do that. A blood vessel can't do that. Skin mm -hmm. can't do that. Now, every tissue has a little has elasticity. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about elasticity. Right. Muscle also has elasticity. Uh -huh. So up to about 10% of the length is just stretch. Nice. Beyond that is actual... Um, excursion of the muscle. Mm -hmm. Now, when you lengthen a bone, the muscle responds by saying, eh, I don't want to make new cells. I'm going to just give up my excursion. Mm -hmm. It's very easy, no energy at all. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a tissue that gets longer right. normally. Yeah. So think about this. Let's say I'm lengthening a bone and the muscle gives up its excursion. Uh -huh. Okay? Yeah. All right. It hasn't grown longer, right? Muscle's not any longer. Right. It just gave 
so it's longer as it's as long as it is in the stretch position right if it didn't actually grow new muscle cells then relative to the bone the muscle is now shorter wow so then you get what we call a contracture oh, i see and you know so when you lengthen the tibia the, the lower leg mm -hmm. and the biggest muscle in the leg which is the gastrosoleus muscles. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that feed into the Achilles tendon, mm -hmm. big calf muscles. Right. They don't like lengthening. <laughs> they don't like growing. Mm -hmm. So what they do, they give up their excursion. Yes. So very soon, they're short relative to the bone, mm -hmm. and the foot goes into a down position because to pull the foot up stretches the muscle, but the muscle won't stretch anymore. They give up the excursion. So you get a contracture, which I think in the lay terms, people refer to as ballerina foot. Mm -hmm. you know, so you get stuck in the, in the knee. Mm -hmm. You'll get a knee contracture where you can't either bend because the quadriceps is tight or you can't straighten because the hamstrings are tight or you get both even worse. Wow. Or you get tightness of certain tissues that are connected to muscles like fascia. Mm -hmm. So um, you get, um, the, the fascia lata mm -hmm. or iliotibial band gets tight. Mm -hmm. And um, so you get this deformity where your, your butt sticks out. Mm -hmm. I think people refer to it as duck ass deformity. And we <laughs> have a different name for it in orthopedics. <laughs> it's a flexion deformity of the hip. Sure. Um, or your knees start turning in because that tissue is tight. Ah. So all of this comes from a failure of the soft tissues to lengthen. Let's see. And so a big part of becoming a limb lengthening surgeon mm -hmm. to understand the, what we call the compliance of the soft tissues mm -hmm. and to lengthen within that compliance. Now it, it lends into the whole subject of rehabilitation because the only way to expand that limit mm -hmm. is to keep, to get the muscles to grow. Right. So how do you get the muscles to grow instead of the muscle giving up its excursion, mm -hmm. we get the muscle to grow by putting it under tension. And a muscle needs to be under tension about six hours a day to grow. Wow. Okay? Yeah. So how many people are working out six hours a day? Not me. I don't even do that. <laughs> no, so what, so, so what you really need to do is build a very good therapy program. Mm. And, and listen, therapy is expensive, so you can't even have a therapy program where people, even if you could give them six hours a day, nobody could afford it. Right, yeah. So what you do is you have a therapy program which basically instructs people what to do at home. Okay. And then people stretch at home multiple times a day. Okay. And the more they stretch, the less problems they're going to have at the end. They're rehabilitating while they're lengthening. Mm. So, it, it's, so there's a whole understanding and philosophy and, and kind of strategy and science behind limb lengthening. Mm. And that's why you know, just knowing how to put in the limb lengthening device, mm -hmm. not enough. And, you know, one of my big fears is that people who have very little experience mm -hmm. with limb lengthening, but they're orthopedic surgeons, they know how to put something like a stride nail because nails are used for broken bones. So every orthopedic surgeon knows how to put them in. So right. technically putting in a stride nail, that's the easiest part of this whole thing. Wow. That's crazy. Okay. The yeah. hard part is you have to have the knowledge how to do the follow-up. Mm -hmm. You have to know what to look for. You have to have uh, hopefully a, the infrastructure to support the necessary physical therapy mm -hmm. that the patient needs to do. Right. And, you know, and then, you, need be, you know, because it's all happening in slow motion, because mm -hmm. lengthening is occurring one millimeter a day. Yeah. The complications and all the problems yeah. occur in slow motion. Wow. They're not catastrophic events. Mm -hmm. You know, even a nerve injury with lengthening yeah. occurs gradually. If you're looking for it, if you're tuned to it, you'll pick it up when the patient's just complaining of some hypersensitivity of the skin. Wow. Wow. Two weeks later, they have a drop foot and can't pull the, the foot wow. up. So that's why, you know, what, What's really critical is the experience of the limb lengthening surgeon to get the feedback from the muscles, from the nerves, from, and this all comes from seeing the patient regularly. Mm -hmm. At our place, we go one step further because the therapy center is part of our institute. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And so our, we train all our therapists. Okay. And it's special type of therapy. And then they're seeing the patients daily. Uh. So if they suspect anything, they think something's different, right. they'll text me right oh. there. And then. Okay. And I'll say, send the patient into the clinic. We'll see. Okay. So that's a unique thing at our place is that there are no delays. Mm-hmm. We have, you know, basically every therapist is a clinician and we're all kind of looking for these, you know, we're, we're looking, we're always on the lookout. It's not just a therapy session. There's a lot more going on that's and that's what keeps people safe. Yeah. And in the end, you're going to keep hearing this. It's almost boring. I'll say it so many times. Mm-hmm. It's all about safety, safety, safety. Mm-hmm. In other words, it's, it's not about how much length. Right. To that's, go back to your original question. Yeah. It's about how much can I do safely? I love it. Yeah. And that makes so much sense because a lot of people who, you know, seek out this surgery, they're looking to get taller, but you just explained in deep detail that, you know, the soft tissues are going to be the limiting factor. And I guess that differs for every patient. You got to know that their muscle flexibility is going to be different. It can be genetic or whether or not they are an athlete, things like that. So I guess an experienced surgeon like yourself can see all that and put that into play and factor that into your decisions. That's, that's amazing. Okay. So are there, let's say that one of these complications do come up for a surgeon who's not as experienced and doesn't know what to look for. What type of surgical intervention interventions that, um, or if you did see this come up, what type of surgical interventions do you have to remedy the situation? Um, let's say if they had a tight calf or uh, their hamstring started to get really tight because of their femur lengthening. So, you know, so there, there's all kinds of things that can happen during lengthening. Mm-hmm. Um, as you mentioned, tightness of muscles yeah. um, and joint contractures mm-hmm. where you literally lose the ability to fully straighten or fully bend a, a joint. Right. Um, so number one, you prov- so it's always better. What is it? Uh, an, an ounce of prevention is, is better than a pound of cure, right? And, <laughs> yeah. um, so it's always better to prevent from getting the contracture mm-hmm. in the first place by having a very robust physical therapy program. I see. And, and that's why, you know, we don't compromise mm-hmm. with anyone's health. Um, if someone comes to us. Yeah. They need to stay locally. Okay. They need to be doing daily therapy mm-hmm. um, and they need to do home exercises uh, on top of that mm-hmm. for several hours a day um, or we're not interested in treating them. Gotcha. So we, we don't do the thing and I know, and, and some people won't come for that reason. You know, they say we can't, I can't take 12 weeks off. Right. Right. Okay. It's fine. Find someone else. <laughs> I'm not, I'm just, you know what? When, when I'm just going to segue for a sec, but sure. when, when someone comes to me, mm-hmm. they, they're walking in normal. Mm-hmm. You're right. They can walk, they can run, they can jump, they can bike, they can do it, whatever they do. Mm-hmm. I could take them, you know, they could go out and do a 5K run and I could time them and, you know, and they, they'd have their own speed and they, you know, they have their own ability. Some of them are more athletic, some of them are more couch potatoes, but whatever it is, they are normal. They don't mm-hmm. have a limp, they don't have pain. Okay. Mm-hmm. When they leave my institute, yeah. When they fully rehabilitate after this whole thing, right. they need to be the same. Wow. So that's our goal. Okay. When I say safety, it's about the danger of cosmetic limb lengthening, mm-hmm. stature lengthening. Right. Is that you're taking people who are totally normal, don't have pain or disability, mm-hmm. and you're potentially giving them pain and disability. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's not a to me, a few centimeters, a few inches Mm -hmm. is not a reasonable trade off for a lifetime of less function, more, you know, less ability to do things or more pain. I see. Wow. It's just not, it's not a trade off. Maybe, maybe individuals feel it is. Mm -hmm. I'm not willing to do that. So for me, if you're going to come to me, my goal is that when you're done, you're as good as you were before the length of it. I see. Okay. Wow. And that's what we, you know, aim to achieve. And I think we achieve it in the vast majority of patients. Yeah. I can tell you 
most centers, the few, let me put it this way, few centers can, can make that brag. Okay. Centers have the data or can show that people, when they're done, have yeah. the same function as they did before. We've even looked at people's 5K running times because a lot of people have that and, and how long it takes to get back to that. It takes two years. Wow. To get to the same level. Okay. Um, but they get back. Yeah. That's the key thing. Right. They're back to most things long before that, but to get to really the same level, it years. takes actually quite a while. And that's crazy. So, and that's okay. People are will, willing to go there and, and the more you work at it. Mm -hmm. But that to me is what it's about. It's about being able to get you back. Mm -hmm. So I want to prevent those complications. Okay. Now, what happens if you get those? Mm -hmm. So if you now have an Aquinas contracture, you know, ballerina foot, or if you now have um, tight knees and so on, now you're looking at surgery. Mm -hmm. and you're looking at lengthening muscles and tendons. Right. Um, in some, and you're looking at nerve decompressions. Mm. So for example, let's say you get a ballerina foot. It means your nerve, not only is your tendon and muscle tight, but to get your foot back up, your entire posterior tibial nerve has to stretch. Mm. So it's not enough to just operate on the muscle and tendon. Right. You have to actually do what's called a nerve decompression. Uh -huh. The surgeon doesn't know this. They're going to cause, they're going to correct one problem and create a new one. Mm. They'll cause a nerve injury. That's crazy. So, it's very, very important to know all of these things. And the only way you get that is by having a lot of experience. Yeah. You know, from this. Nerve decompression is an essential skill. Yeah. A lot of orthopedic surgeons don't have skills at either prophylactically or therapeutically decompressing mm -hmm. nerves. Um, you know, another really good, and every one of these things I'm telling you, I see patients who've had limb lengthening yeah. at other centers that end up coming to me to fix the problems. No way. That's crazy. And look, and, and by the way, a lot of the times the reason they went to, you know, surgeon A or surgeon B is because of cost. Mm. So what you have to figure is, and in the end to fix the problem costs them more than, <laughs> than the original surgery. So we have to really put a price on your health and safety. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times you get what you pay for. Yeah. Uh, and it's not worth um, traveling halfway around the world to go to some place that offers it for half the price or whatever, right. or even less. And and then people say, but then I could never afford it. Yeah, but you'll walk again and you'll, you won't you will have all the problems that you're gonna have. Um, we see such a long list, laundry list of problems. For, one, one common one mm -hmm. um, is a technical error. It's, uh, it's how the surgeons fix the fibula. Mm. So the fibula is the smaller bone in the lower leg. Yeah. So there are certain ways to fix it and certain ways not to. Some mm -hmm. surgeons fix it at one end, some at the other, at both ends. Mm -hmm. And um, again, without making this into a technical teaching session, there's a right <laughs> way to do it. Not a lot of people don't do it the best way. Wow. So what happens is they don't fix the lower end of the fibula correctly. Fibula participates in the ankle joint, mm -hmm. and the fibula starts. The reason you fix the fibula is so, because the lengthening device is only attached to the tibia. Right. You bolt the fibula to the tibia mm -hmm. so it comes along for the ride. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. If it doesn't, if it gets left behind, at the ankle joint in particular, it'll cause severe ankle problems, even arthritis. Mm -hmm. Okay. And people don't know that. And it takes several years till that happens. It's all related to the original limb lengthening problem at the upper end if you don't fix it properly what it can lead to is a knee contracture or a nerve injury mm. and just from lack of knowing these things in the femur if you don't prophylactically lengthen the iliotibial band mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes also higher up what's called the fascia lata, mm -hmm. you'll end up with dark ass deformity you'll end up with knee contractures you end up with a variety of problems that all can be avoided. Mm. So limb lengthening is more about the strategy and knowing what to do, not just sticking a silly stride nail in a femur. <laughs> wow. So yeah. So the surgeon has to be qualified, experienced, and like you said, just not well, just versed in stature lengthening, but other forms of deformity uh, construction and um, 
uh, techniques, like you said, uh, fixating the fibula at the distal and proximal point. Um, I know Just you. One, one last comment on that. Yeah. So, the you know when you talk about experience qualifications, mm -hmm. people should beware mm -hmm. of any surgeon who just does cosmetic stature lengthening or principally does cosmetic stature lengthening. Yeah. Um, if you, you look at my own experience, I do thousands of lengthenings. Mm -hmm. The majority have been for leg length difference. Right. In my okay. case. Not for cosmetic stature lengthening. Mm -hmm. um, and, but the amount that I've learned from lengthening a short tibia, short femur, short humerus, mm -hmm. you know, short form, all these things, you learn so much about um, the complications of limb lengthening and more importantly, how to get out of the complications yes. and how to treat them. So that experience mm -hmm. translates again into safety for my patients. Mm -hmm. Should There's almost nothing that can come up yeah. that I can't deal with and prevent and reverse. Wow. Very, very little. Wow. And, but you don't get that experience from doing stature lengthening. Right. You only get that experience from being a limb lengthening surgeon first. Right. And a stature lengthening surgeon second. Now, mm -hmm. I do more stature length than anybody in the United States. <laughs> and yet, it's a small part of my practice. Right. Because the rest of my practice is limb lengthening and deformity correction, mm -hmm. you know, for a wide, but that aspect of my practice mm -hmm. prepares me to be a better stature lengthening surgeon. I see. So beware of those people out there yeah. who are advertising stature lengthening. You'll notice we don't advertise stature lengthening. Yeah. We are a limb lengthening center. You, you won't see us on this show and that show and, you know, and, and, you know, and it, it, all the time of talking about stature lengthening because mm -hmm. for me, it's more about limb lengthening as a whole, mm -hmm. and not just cosmetic stature lengthening. And yet, if you want to get publicity, publish scientific articles, mm. write papers, do studies. Yeah, that we do. We have, we have two papers on cosmetic stature length. Yeah, we have I've read them. lots of papers on lots of aspects of limb lengthening. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. That's what you want to look. So if you're doing research, which surgeon should I choose? Mm -hmm. Choose the surgeon who has the experience, not just in cosmetic, but in limb lengthening for dwarfism, mm -hmm. for limb length discrepancy, as well as for cosmetic. Right. Choose the surgeon who reviews their patients, publishes their results, mm -hmm. is scientifically honest, yeah. and not the surgeon that you see on the doctor show. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. All right. So, like you said, experience is super important. Um, and we talked about some complications uh, and, and how to track, you know, to a, that the surgeon should be able to adapt to anything that comes up. Um, you at your center have an incredible track record of success. And like you say, you don't have to advertise that. It's all over the place. People know it just from your sheer reputation alone. But one of the things that I hear from people who ask me questions is, what, what are some long-term complications that could come up if, you know, a surgeon doesn't catch something um, soon enough? And, you know, 5, 10, maybe 15 years down the line, what could potentially be some of the drawbacks uh, long-term? Sure. That's a great question, Victor. So, look. Um, I'll start by saying that, and, and I have followed some of my patients for 30 years. Whoa. So, okay. So no, it's important because look, you know, um, it may, we, we have a saying, nothing spoils good results like good follow-up. Yeah. That, I you know? love it. And, and so you, we got to be honest. We, you know, we got to be transparent and honest. Otherwise, we're literally preying on patients. And mm. I don't do that. I'm not willing to do that or participate in that. Right. So it's you know it can't be about just about making money off of stature lengthening. I that we can talk about that later. But that, I worry about that because it is a you know self pay type of medicine. Um. So when things are done correctly. Mm -hmm what we're seeing in the long term right. is no effect. Wow. That's the most important thing. Okay. We're not seeing arthritis in those patients. Right. We're not seeing late nerve problems. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing any 
surprise problems to their joints or, you know, we're, and we're not seeing, um, you know, we're really not seeing anything out of the ordinary when it's done correctly. I see. Okay. When things are done incorrectly, mm -hmm. we're seeing lots of problems, short and long term. Mm. Let's take that fibula thing I talked to you about where the fibula bone just migrates up two or three millimeters. Right. Can you imagine that's how little three twenty fifths of an inch. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it's not secure enough. Mm -hmm. It migrates up two or three millimeters. Mm -hmm. They're going to get arthritis of the ankle. What? Yeah. What? So is that a good trade off? Not at all. <laughs> right. They're going to get arthritis and that'll lead to pain, limp disability. That's crazy. Either, either an ankle fusion or ankle replacement at a later age. Simply from not fixing the fibula correctly. That's crazy. Okay? And it's a very common problem. Mm, mm, mm. Okay? Um, another common problem mm -hmm. uh, with tibial lengthening is getting valgus deformity of the knee or knock knee deformity. Right. Okay. And that happens both with external fixators and with nails. Mm -hmm. um, again, if you're not familiar with, and, and I've created that before we knew about these things, you know, so, and it, I've gone through my learning curve and mm -hmm. that's what I'm trying to get at. Right. So every surgeon, when they're starting, there's a learning curve. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's a reason they tell you that the more experience that, you know, a surgeon has probably the better. Right. So I've made my mistakes. Mm -hmm. I've gone through that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I've gone through it both in the, Kid in the patients with limb length discrepancy as well mm -hmm. as the stature patient. Right. And so the, we don't get this valgus deformity or knock knee anymore. There's ways to prevent that. Mm. And, and it, 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 it comes from doing certain things because you anticipate other things. Uh -huh. So there's some technical tips to doing that. So, yeah. and what happens if you get a knock knee deformity? Mm -hmm. Well, then you eventually get some knee pain, maybe mm -hmm. arthritis of the knee, and so on. Wow. So, the, and these things take 20 years to develop, all as a consequence of the original surgery. That's crazy. Okay. Um, so, there's many, many of these things that can be very delayed mm -hmm. because of uh, what was done. Now, the more severe ones, of course, don't take that long. I, I can't, it, it, I, it's almost a horror show if I showed you case after case after case of what has been done to patients. I get angrier and angrier yeah. all the time. And I, I think it's, um, and I see it more in the cosmetic group mm -hmm. than I see in other areas. I see. Surgeons don't take on limb lengthening um, for non-cosmetic reasons because mm -hmm. it's not, lucrative mm -hmm. right they take on limb lengthening for stature because it's cash pay see so it's a very mercenary business mercenary and business. that's how i look at it you know look i orthopedic surgeons are pain and disability doctors right. that's what we're trained at mm -hmm. we're not plastic surgeons we're not trained to do cosmetic surgery right none of us not a single one of us mm -hmm. there's no tradition of cosmetic surgery in orthopedic surgery. Mm -hmm. So this is a brand new area. Right. That's kind of, and, and what's happened is, you know, you hear all the time about reimbursement for doctors and this, the insurance companies have clamped down reimbursement for Medicare from mm -hmm. insurance companies has, has gone down and down and down. So a hip replacement, you know, when I started doing surgery, might have reimbursed $10,000. Mm -hmm. Now a hip replacement reimburses $1,000. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But, well, but it's, that, that's how it is. Yeah, yeah. The doctors are looking for, surgeons are looking for, you know, ways to augment their income mm -hmm. with um, doing self-pay pay, self -pay mm -hmm. surgery. Yeah. And cosmetic surgery is very attractive. Mm -hmm. This the technology now is good enough that it is, and it's easy enough for doctors to put in a nail yeah. that 
a lot of people want to do cosmetic lengthening right because it's lucrative mm -hmm. okay so they'll advertise and they'll market themselves and on and on and on but they ain't got the goods so to speak. <laughs> okay they don't have the experience they don't have and so what happens is patients are at risk mm -hmm. okay so again, my message to the consumer mm -hmm. is you got to really ask questions. Yeah. Not just, you know, not accept everything you're told. How many cases have you done? Mm -hmm. okay. And you got to be careful because people um, make up numbers. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually listened to, to your interviews and one of your surgeons said they'd see four to six cases a week. I happen right. to know that that surgeon did two in all of 200, 2020. Wow. And there may be eight cases in 2019. How is it possible that that surgeon is saying they do four to six a week? Mm. So what I'm getting at is you got to be careful. Yeah. I think there's a few leaders in this field. Mm -hmm. This is an early, this is a young field. Right. And I would stay, stick with, uh, the ones who have a lot of experience, if you value your own health, mm -hmm. willing to th throw the dice, yeah. and you know, take your, then sure. Go to, but you got to really be careful. You got to pick people with experience who know how to solve the complications. More importantly, that will prevent the complications. Yeah. And hopefully you won't get into too much trouble. So besides asking, you know, um, how many cases they've done, what, like, let's say two more questions that, a, you know, a prospective patient should really to vet the potential surgeon that they want to go with. What would you think that those questions should be that the patient should ask? Um, you know, with any other surgery, I would say, can I speak to people who've been through this? Okay. Uh, I, it, I don't do that with cosmetic limb lengthening so much right. because um, patients are very private about this. Okay. I don't like, um, although at our institute, what we do do, we have so many of these patients around. Uh -huh. and now we're doing a lot of online consultations, but mm -hmm. uh, before COVID, we, you know, everybody came in for their consultation. Right. And we take them on a tour of the Institute, including a physical therapy. Okay. And, and um, we, in advance, ask the patients who are in PT, mm -hmm. who are going through cosmetic limb lengthening, right. if they would mind speaking to other prospective patients. Okay. And uh, a lot of our patients are agreeable to that. So it is helpful to talk to other patients. Other patients. But it, yeah, see the lay of the land, see the whole team. Okay. The other thing to be aware of, mm -hmm. this is a team sport. Right. If someone doesn't have a dedicated team doing this, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to feel very... Uh, exposed mm. you know um, and you know at our center um, my success is not just due to my experience not just due to my surgical technical skills mm -hmm. it's due to the team team I have an amazing team in, right. in fact nobody in the United States even comes close to our team <laughs> you know we, we have First of all, we have a full-time stature coordinator, Angelique, mm -hmm. who speaks with all the patients, usually in advance, and wow. follows them. Um, we have, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Robbins, who's 100% part of the surgical team. Mm -hmm. We have a group of, phys of, of physical therapists who specifically work with the stature patients. Really? They are. And funny. so, you know, they're, they're, uh, uh, they're amazing. Yeah. I mean, our, our PTs are, are really incredible, okay. uh, second to none. Uh, we have physician assistants, a whole team of them. They're always available, okay. you know, for the patients seven days a week, 24-7. Mm -hmm. So if a patient has a problem, they, there's someone around and available for them. Yeah. We'll see them on a weekend. We'll see them on a weekday, a weeknight, you know, whatever is needed, depending on, you know, if it can't wait till the next day. Right. Um, so you're, you know, the whole mentality of the place runs to support limb lengthening. Okay. Most places incorporate limb lengthening as part of what else they do. So they don't have the team, they don't have the support or they don't have the physical therapy center. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the infrastructure there, right. It's, you're going to feel exposed. You're going to feel 
at risk sometimes. Mm -hmm. You'll know the places that have the team, the infrastructure, that's the places that are safest. Okay. It's all about safety. Gotcha. Yeah, team sport. And like you said, technical skills isn't enough. You need to have the team in place uh, to make this a successful outcome. All right, Dr. Paley, I want to kind of tra transition a little to, you know, patients looking for stature lengthening uh, for the cosmetic aspect. One of the biggest concerns that a lot of them have is proportions. Um, what do you usually tell your patients uh, or do you find that not all of them care. They don't care about looking like a Vitruvian man. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, you know, we, humans have a certain range mm -hmm. of so-called normal. Mm -hmm. um, in, you know, the, the important proportions to consider that everybody asks about right. is lower limb to upper body height. Right. Uh, so, you know, normally from your hips down, Mm -hmm. compared to from your hips to the top of your head. Yeah. Okay. Um, the lower body is 52% and the upper body is about 48%. Okay. That The range is probably from about uh, 50 to 52. That's mm -hmm. the normal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what's noticeable mm -hmm. when people are off, interestingly, yeah. is not so much if the lower limbs are longer, mm -hmm. but if the lower limbs are proportionally shorter. Okay. So like we, we see this in, in uh, dwarfism. So achondroplastic or hypochondroplastic dwarfisms mm -hmm. are what we call a disproportionate dwarfism. Okay. So the lower and upper limbs are, didn't grow, but the spine grew. Uh -huh. Okay. So they are, um, so they, they, have short legs, shorter arms, normal torso. Right. Now, it, and, and that's an extreme example because dwarf, it, it, there the difference is quite significant. It could be 10 to 12 inches wow. shorter yeah. from the legs relative to your trunk. Mm -hmm. So there you notice it. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay? Yeah. In small differences, you really don't notice it, number one. Yeah. And number two, there is... In, in, especially in Western society, there is kind of an attraction okay. to longer lower limbs. So yeah. you, if you look at even Barbie dolls, Ken dolls, <laughs> okay, you ever notice those things are built with disproportionately long legs, yeah. okay? I mean, that's not normal. Right. You know? um, and, um, but <laughs> it, you know, models, models like accentuating their long legs, right? Mm -hmm. How do they do that? They um, dress differently. So they, 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 they cut their, like in a bathing suit, they cut the, ba the bathing suit in a real V like yeah. that. So the right. leg looks longer. longer. Legs not longer. <laughs> You're just seeing part of their, you know, glute, gluteal region as part of their, their uh, leg now. So it right. looks longer. Yeah. So, so we like the look of longer legs. Mm -hmm. So, being disproportionate on the long side for the lower limbs within reason right. is, is, is perhaps even attractive. It's, it's, in, okay. it's in favor of the patient. Yeah. Then we get into proportion between above and below the knee, mm -hmm. yeah. eye versus lower leg. So the Vitruvian man, the length of the, from the knee joint to the bottom of the foot is equal to the thigh length. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. But if you just look at the tibia bone, mm -hmm. the tibia is 80% the length of the femur. Okay. Now there's a range of normal 0.78 to 0.82. Right. The normal range. And, you know, so if you're 0.78, your tibia is proportionally a little shorter. Right. If you're 0.82, your tibia is proportionally a little longer. I see. Now, honestly, that stuff's very soft. Mm -hmm. It's not, it, it doesn't affect function much. Right. It doesn't, and it depends how much disproportion. Right. Now, you lengthen someone three inches in the thigh. Yeah. Is that a problem? Because you've changed the ratio. Mm -hmm. Now you're like 0. 0.70. Okay. Right? To be as much shorter relative to the femur. Mm -hmm. Functionally, it's not a problem. Okay. Um, Aesthetically, it's probably not 
noticeable. Mm -hmm. Most patients do not notice it. Yeah. Um, the um, only time people notice it is when, if they do exercises in deep squats. Mm -hmm. So when you squat with weights on. Right. If your thigh is longer, your butt sticks out further behind your heels. Yeah. And the, the, that can actually throw your balance off a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, so okay. there is, the, it, if you're really into bodybuilding and squatting is really critical, yeah. having that disproportion may bother you. The majority of people, not going to bother. Not so much. Okay. Interestingly, you can see where people's feet are. You can see where their knees are, but you don't see where their hips are. Mm -hmm. right? right. We wear our belts higher and lower, yeah. depending how we want to look. Mm -hmm. We wear them higher, the leg look, your thigh looks longer. You wear your, your, your um, belt lower, your thigh, lo your, your, your thigh segment looks shorter. Mm -hmm. So we can hide the length, a longer thigh. Yeah. You, it's very hard to hide the lower leg. Right. So for that reason, um, if you want it to be less noticeable, lengthen the thighs. Okay. Now, you could say the opposite. If you want it more noticeable, yeah. then you lengthen the lower leg. <laughs> okay. But there's pros and cons to lengthening the thigh versus the leg, the femur versus the tibia, mm -hmm. um, that are far more important than proportion. Mm -hmm. Now, if you really don't like the idea of disproportion, then you're going to have to lengthen both the tibia and the femur. <laughs> and, and a lot of people do that. I have uh, probably over a third of the patients I lengthen are doing both. Wow. Femur and tibia. And, and uh, you know, and, and, and a lot of patients like that. And the results are excellent. Yeah. But it's a lot more to go through and it's more expensive. Mm -hmm, right. And I was going to touch on that while we're on that uh, uh, lengthening both tibias and the femurs. For a patient who wants to gain more height, um, what do you suggest is the best time frame they should put between the, the two surgeries and which set of bones should they lengthen first? What are your recommendations there? So, you know, when I, for me, the first thing I want to understand from a patient yeah. is what are their goals? Okay. What, what, what do they want to achieve? Yeah. And, um, you know, whether height goals yeah. and, uh, specifically, and, um, and then some patients have a feeling that they're shorter in this segment than that, mm -hmm. by the way, interestingly, in all respect to all patients, 90% of the time, maybe closer to hundred percent of the time, mm -hmm. when a patient says, yeah, my, my lower leg is really proportionally short compared to my thigh. Yeah. And we take the x-ray and they're 0.80. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, or my legs are really short compared to my torso and they're exactly 0.52, you know? So it's, 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 it's what they're telling you is actually very valid, mm -hmm. but it's body image. I see. It's not centimeters. It's mm -hmm. not inches. It's not necessarily actual, right. but it's how they see themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's really valid. Okay. And, and one of the things I've learned as I've done this over the years yeah. is the understanding and sensitivity of stature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I first started this as a young doctor, I, you know, um, you know, I, I, I was okay doing this for people who fell below the fifth percentile for height. Right. You know, so below five foot four. Mm -hmm. so male five two, okay. Someone even, I actually, I remember I had an assistant named Harry. Harry was five foot four. And my joke was, I don't lengthen anyone who's taller than Harry. <laughs> <laughs> he was the measure. You know, <laughs> And Harry was the most confident guy at five foot four you'd ever met and had no issues with his stature. And that was my cocky, insensitive outlook at the whole thing. I see. As I've matured, oops, sorry. <laughs> trying to shut off my phone. And, um, Harry sorry. heard you. <laughs> um, as I've matured and, um, you know, uh, met a lot, a lot of patients mm -hmm. who seek stature lengthening. Yeah. Um, I won't even call them short stature patients. Yeah. If somebody comes to me at 5'11 how, who wants stature lengthening, yeah. you can't call this short stature, right? Right. So when I talk to patients, 
it, it's made me understand the problem better. Mm -hmm. And the majority of people who come to me or mm -hmm. came to me in the past, um, we studied them with a psychologist. So in the early days, because I felt I was walking on thin ice, yeah. you know, I'm open to criticism. I was the only guy in the country doing it. Wow. Okay. So now you, you got a list of names. Yeah. Let me tell you in 1988, no one, no one dared to do this. It was, it was even bad enough doing it for dwarfism, <laughs> but for, for normal people, you know, yeah. who felt that they were short. Right. Um, it was basically, it was professional suicide. <laughs> I know it was, it was, yeah. it was really, and there was no one else, no one, no. very lonely. Yeah. Um, and, but we did it and we did it quietly and we did it slowly and we did it safely. Okay. We don't have a single disaster from that group. Wow. Okay? So I'm proud to say that. Yeah. You know, and every year I did a few more. Okay. A few more. I did it very responsibly. Right. I did hundreds of lengthenings for limb length discrepancy, yeah. for dwarfism, mm -hmm. but for cosmetics, I yeah. went really slowly. Okay. And because God forbid I injured somebody. Yeah. God forbid I'm, you know, made someone permanently disabled. Yeah. Something like that. Right. And, right. you know, so we, we did it very carefully. Mm -hmm. And what we learned and we tested everyone. See, we wouldn't do anyone without a psychological evaluation. Okay. Now I don't require that. Right. But back then I did. Yeah. And I felt if I do this, mm -hmm. I can then say, look, I took every measure and we had the same psychologist evaluate every patient for 22 years. That's oh, yeah. a long time. Walter. Uh, Wind yeah. I think yeah. Really Walter Windisch. Yeah. He was fantastic. And we published, it's in my paper. Yeah, I really. published the results of this. And basically what we found is that, pretty much all these patients, everyone, mm -hmm. shared one thing, mm -hmm. that this was um, a body image issue. Okay. And they perceived themselves as short. Okay. And it had nothing to do with what their height actually was. Wow. So my prejudice of having like a threshold, yeah. I won't link to anyone who's taller than 5'4", five, 5'6", five, 5'8". Five, <laughs> and every year I raised that threshold. <laughs> I'd gotten to 5'8", when I finally threw it away. Okay. Right. I, I mean, one of my, the best stories was a guy 5'11", who came to see me. Wow. He flew in from Holland. Mm -hmm. And um, I was in Baltimore. And, you know, he says, listen, uh, the Dutch are the tallest people in the world. And, and you know, I, I'm in a very kind of tall group of friends and family. And I feel really short. Yeah. And you know what? He was right. Relative to the people he hung out with. Right. 5'11 was short. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's hard to even fathom. I can't. But all, you know, all his friends were 6'6, six, six, you know. It's oh, like, yeah. so 5'11 is, is quite short, you know. When, um, so I, nowadays, I would have lengthened him. I see. I back see. then, I sent him back. <laughs> I said, I'm five eleven and a half. I'm looking the guy in the eye and saying, Come on. You know, <laughs> you I can't crazy. justify and, and you know why? Because yeah. I was being judgmental. Okay. So you cannot use your own eyes mm -hmm. to judge other people. Okay. You have to understand what they're seeing through their eyes. You have to understand their own body image. Mm -hmm. Okay. And their body image is yeah. that they are short. I had a guy recently told me he can never go into a Starbucks unless it's empty. I said, why? He says, because there's always a line there. And right. he feels when he stands in the line that everybody's looking at him and seeing how short he is. <laughs> it, but it's, what it is, is he's looking at himself. Okay. No one else is noticing him. We yeah. both know that. Yeah. Nobody's nobody's standing yeah, there sure. saying, "Look at the shrimp at the back of the line." Yeah. Even though he's five eight. Yeah. Okay. He's not saying that, <laughs> but he sees it, and he and 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 as soon as you lengthen that person, and I did. Yeah. The switch turns off. Okay. And whatever bothered him before is gone. That's incredible. And that's what we learned. Okay. We did before and after interviews with these people. Mm -hmm. And once I understood this, I stopped doing all the. 
all the psychological evals. I can do it myself. Right. Know what questions to ask. And, and I've learned to appreciate what people who go through this mm -hmm. are thinking, how yeah. they feel. Listen, I had a 62 year old cardiac surgeon from Canada <laughs> come down to me. Wow. Okay. Right. Very yes. successful financially, professionally, mm -hmm. on his second wife, <laughs> kids, all grown up, grandfather. Can you tell me why that guy wants to do stature lengthening? Yeah. I can. For the same been. reason the guy at 22 wants to do it. I see. It bothered him since he was a teenager. Right. He was juvenilized by others for his height. Mm. Uh, and no matter... He gained so much stature in his professional life. Yeah. He's a famous cardiac surgeon. Okay. Mm -hmm. That kind of stature didn't matter. Wow. The stature that mattered for him was his body image. I lengthened him five centimeters, uh -huh. two inches. Right. And it changed his life. That's incredible. Okay. Yeah. So these, these experiences have taught me so much. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why people come to us for lengthening. It's a whole different experience. Yeah. We understand where these, where most people are coming from. We've seen this. We've, we've, you know, and, and, and it, our program's designed around it. Mm. And you study it. Cause I know a lot of other um, people, uh, experts, they don't believe in the term that you actually coined height dysphoria, height neurosis, um, but based on what you just said, it's a true mental disorder that um, you believe this surgery can uh, correct. So, so they don't believe, you know, the word belief should be limited to religion. Um, <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> this is not religion. This is science. Um, it's not about belief or not. Yeah. It, it's about um, scientific study. Okay. You know, look, I, I didn't coin this, the, when I started doing this. In fact, I had a lot of prejudices about this myself. Right. Yeah. Um, I've basically been humbled. Mm. I've been sensitized. Yeah. I have learned from this. So yeah, these new guys in the block that are getting out there and think that they know everything. Sure. <laughs> uh, you know, read, read, read the papers. Look what we've done. Mm -hmm we've understood this, we've analyzed this, you know, there's actually a huge body of literature yeah. about the psychology of stature, mm -hmm. too tall and too small. Right. Both. Yeah. Both. Um, and in fact, there is a, a great book it's out of print called too tall, too small. Uh -huh. Everyone should read it. It's a little yeah. quick read. And you know, it's important to understand that anyone who's doing this should read all that stuff mm -hmm. and understand it. And then they wouldn't poo poo it. Yeah, look, there are some people who come to me because they want to, they, they, they're too short to be a model. Right. Yeah. I can tell you they're, you know, that, that's probably not, that, that is, that is the exception, not the, uh. not, not the hum thing. <laughs> have we done that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we have people who come to me and say, you know, but it's extremely rare. I want to be taller because I want to be a basketball player. Well, you're not going to be a better basketball player because you're tall. <laughs> okay. So it, we don't make people better at sports. Yeah. We're struggling just to keep them at the same level they were before. Yeah, I told I you that before. Yeah. So no, the, the majority of people who are bothered by their height mm -hmm. and who are going to spend, you know, somewhere around a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars you know, to have an operation for their height. One of the most expensive, um, Cosmetic procedures, right? Yeah. Okay. Tell me one woman who spends a hundred thousand dollars to get her breasts done. It's, it's just that's not what you know. This the implants alone here, you know, are twenty thousand plus each. Hmm. You, know, you need two of them for two bones, four for four bones. You're right. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, this is a very expensive, and you know, and it's not a two-hour surgery. It's it's a three-month procedure with physical right. therapy, with yeah. follow-up, with X-rays, with doctor's visits, mm -hmm. you know, and so on. So this is, this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And most people are not going to do this for frivolous reasons. Wow. And body image is not a frivolous reason. Absolutely. It is real. And it's, you know, look, you've been through this, right? Yeah. And um, I, I mean, I, and I don't know your background, 
but tell me I'm not telling you everything that you already know. I know it. It's, it's true. It's true. It changes you on the other side when you have the procedure done. If, like you said, it flips something, it's a switch. And that's why I'm doing this to kind of like highlight it because I know um, it's you, but you have to have experienced surgeons because there are a lot of risks involved. And, but, but if you do it safely and you come out on the other side, it can change your life. And I think that you're right about that. That's amazing. That you and, brought and you that. know, there, there, there are, um, I, 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 I've, I've written and said, it's not about the amount of lengthening. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's, I, I love this game. I call it the number game. Everyone sits <laughs> in my, in my um, consultation room and, and they give me a number. This is yeah. what they want to be. <laughs> and then they go through the process and then they change the number. Oh yeah. And, and I, I always write down what their original number is. <laughs> and I say, but you wanted, you know, they, they decide to stop at five centimeters. Ah. I said, you wanted eight centimeters. Yeah. And they say, um, yeah, but it doesn't bother me anymore. Whatever it is, is gone. Wow. They literally tell me that. That's so crazy. whatever it is, is gone. And even though they could do more, it doesn't cost them any more. Yeah. They're done. It's, it's over. So it's, it's not even about the amount of length you do. Yeah. It's, it's about the process. It's about being able to do something about it. And I think it, it proves even more that it is a body image yeah. thing. It's not about actually how tall you are. No. It's about how you see yourself. Right. I think I completely agree with that. I think it's the result that this procedure can give you on the other side, not just the procedure of getting taller. It's what the height can do for you. Uh, incredible, incredible way to kind of get to the ending here. One more uh, question here, Dr. Pilly. Um, you are a true innovator of the field. I mean, you, you were the first to use the original precise internal nail. And now since then you've improved on it with the next version the precise two and the most recent, super strong stride now, which allows full weight bearing. I just want to ask you, how have you, what type of benefits have you seen this new nail um, give you in your practice with your patients? Well, you know, uh, it's been a long evolution from the Lazaroff device, which is circular external fixator, right. then to straight bar external fixators that were <laughs> less bulky, you know, monolateral devices. Mm -hmm. Then we developed a procedure I developed in 1990 called lengthening over nail, which uh -huh. reduced the external fixator time for right. the nail and a fixator together and took the fixator off early. And then we started using actually the first implantable nail, the uh, Albizia mm -hmm. nail was available, used that in the 90s. Okay. And then okay. we started the ISKD, which is a disastrous nail because it had no rate control. Yeah. And then, and then the precise one, mm -hmm. the precise two, and the stride. And that's been kind of the evolution. Yeah. So we've kind of done everything, um, literally done hundreds of each of these implants. You know, I did like three or 400 ISKDs and thousands of circular and monolateral fixators. And, you know, now I, I've, I've done... Uh, you know, well over a thousand uh, precise and uh, several hundred of the stride, which only came out uh, in May, 2018. Uh -huh. And as we went through this, and it's one of the things I said early on, that this will never catch on mm -hmm. until the technology gets to the point yeah. that we can do it with minimal incision surgery, which mm -hmm. we can do now. Right. And where patients can walk around like normal. Mm -hmm. with the rods so the rods have to be strong enough ah. so the precise was made of titanium it really wasn't strong enough mm -hmm. it was too flexible and it would break in fact mm -hmm. um, and, it, and patients had to be in wheelchairs and on crutches and walkers for five months mm -hmm. you know? um, and um, then you know so we started to develop this new project mm -hmm. full weight bearing nail that's and that's what's called the stride and I started that project with uh, uh, the company that Nuvasiv, who now owns the technology, bought called Ellipse. Mm -hmm. And then we continued it with Nuvasiv. Okay. And they really did a great job on this. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so now we have the stride nail since May 2018. And for the very first time, yeah. very first time ever, we have a full weight bearing uh, nail with a really good mechanism that can both lengthen and shorten. Why shorten? Because yeah. let's say you get into trouble, you can always back up. If you, like, right. you know, so it's a safety feature. We don't use it very often. 
Right. Um, so it's a really great, and it's a very reliable device. Uh -huh. Not the last device that's going to come out. There'll be new devices. They'll be fully automated. You operate it from your cell phone. <laughs> you know, Biofeedback devices will tell you what if your muscles are feeling too much tension. Oh, yeah. That, all of that's coming. It's actually in the works. Oh, really? It's really amazing technology that, that will come. And we know that. But we're finally, for the first time, yeah. at a point yeah. where there is a device that I'm really happy with. Wow. That I really, this is the device that is finally to the point that I think this can be done by more people. Okay. Not just me. Uh -huh. Remember, it was just me in the beginning. Right. And then, right. you know, and, and then, you know, many of the people on your uh, dream team there, <laughs> I, I trained them and they all, you know, they, they were, um, they worked with me and, you know. And, yeah, you hired my doctor. <laughs> uh, Dr. Conway. Dr. Conway. Uh, I trained her and I hired her and on and on. She's very good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Dr. Rosberg is excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. You know, and so on. So, uh, um, but, um, and, and, you know, and they've gone through their learning first. Right. And they've done it correctly. And they have teams. Mm -hmm. And they, they, so all the things that I've just gone through. Yeah. You know, and so I think now we've created the recipe of how to do this correctly. Yeah. And that's what has to happen. Okay. So more, it, it, it should become more available. Right. And, um, you know, and, and, but I, what I, what I'm, my biggest fear is that despite the technology, despite all this stuff, yeah, we've made it so easy yeah. to access this stuff and to use that people say, Oh, I can put that in. And technically they probably can, yeah. but then they'll, all the stuff that we already talked about yeah to create disasters problems yeah that you can fix <laughs> that, that are avoidable yeah. so don't forget all this other stuff exactly. safety 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 the I first 10 priorities are safety safety and then everything else that's amazing great way to put a cap on all well dr paley you're truly the best of the best and your reputation precedes you so if anyone's interested in after hearing this interview to go to the great legendary dr paley how can they reach out to you for a consultation yeah i mean so we have a website paleyinstitute.org uh, they uh, they can contact uh my email is also available um you know d paley at uh paleyinstitute.org okay. uh, and they can contact Angelique at our website. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, most importantly, they should go and read the uh, FAQs, Frequently Asked Questions, okay. which can be downloaded off our website. Right. We are going to, by this Friday, I'm yeah. going to announce it here first. Okay. We're launching a new stature lengthening website. What? Okay, so I've never done that before. I mean, yeah. stature lengthening has been wrapped into our other website, yeah. but I decided to create uh, a, a standalone stature lengthening website. It, our URL is limblengthening.org. Okay. O -R -G. You may get the sense, I, I don't do dot coms, I do dot orgs because <laughs> to get the message across, this is not about making money. This mm -hmm. is about an organization. Mm -hmm. It is about safety. It's about a team. And that's what the org is, okay. the organization. organization. And um, they don't allow dot .institute. Otherwise, they'd have that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the, um, just go to look up stuff on the web or look up my name. I'm sure you'll get to Paley Orthopedic and Spine Institute, West Palm Beach, Florida. Definitely one thing I'm going to go out there on a limb. Mm -hmm. The nicest place to rehab yeah. This is weather. I moved down here from Baltimore. It's like a little piece of heaven down here. <laughs> it is absolutely gorgeous and uh, a little warm in the summer, but it's okay. I, I kind of like it. But wow. um, it really, it, that's actually important because with no winter, no ice no, to slip on, <laughs> you know, all this stuff, really important for someone who is an orthopedic patient. Yeah. And you can wear shorts, you can wear a short sleeve shirt. It, it is actually easier to, uh, Go through an orthopedic procedure in a weather like this so yeah we'd love to see you uh we do zoom consultations okay. uh, so online consultations especially since covid right uh, we do in-person consultations uh, we see patients from 95 different countries wow. so um and from all 50 states 
for not just for stature, but for limb lengthening, for leg length discrepancy, and so on. Right. And uh, yeah, we're easy to find, uh, and uh, I'm very happy to uh, um, give advice to anyone who's interested in any of these aspects. Yeah. Well, I thank you so much because of the fact that's that's one of the reasons I wanted, why I wanted you to come on to have your sheer knowledge and vast experience to speak to the people. Well, um, I'll be sure to post all your website and social links in the show notes. So if, if anybody wants to reach out to him, you can do that there. Uh, Dr. Pelly, any final words for someone who is interested in limb lengthening? You said it, safety. Would you uh, want to leave them with anything? Um, it's a growing experience. Okay. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be corny. Um, awesome. No, it, it's... Um, Listen, uh, it's just uh, it, it's educate yourself as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the more you know, the more you understand. I really, I think the educated consumer mm -hmm. um, is is going to protect themselves the best and get themselves the best treatment. Mm -hmm. And um, educate yourself and make sure you're getting all the information both online to read it. Uh, you know, look for any uh, scientific publications, mm -hmm. make sure you're getting the information from your uh, surgeon, make sure that uh, you, if, if you can get to speak to other patients and so on and get their experience. Uh, I'm sure some of the blogs help, yeah. um, you know. So, no, I, I think just do your homework okay. and, uh, you know, uh, make sure people as transparent as possible and, and then figure you got to trust who you're going to work with. Mm -hmm. And, and if you get to that point, then that's probably the right person to trust your care to. I love it. Well, all right, everyone. That is Dr. Dror Paley of the Paley and Orthopedic Spine Institute in West Palm Beach, Florida in the United States. Dr. Paley, thank you so much for your time. It was an absolute pleasure. Hey, great talking to you, Victor. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Dr. Paley. He's a genius pioneer and the most experienced surgeon in the field of limb lengthening and deformity correction. If you're interested in reaching out to Dr. Paley and his team of experts, you can find all of his contact information in the show notes. Until next time, this is Victor from Cyborg for Life, signing out.